Well, good morning and happy Valentine's early. If you came last night, <clears throat> you had a great time and it ought to carry over to the day. We had a wonderful time last night. A lot of fun, a lot of smiles, a lot of good things happened. And I'm glad for every one of you that came and for every one of you that helped in any way to make it perfect. And it was. So let's have a good time today and uh, get ready for the real Valentine's Day to be here very soon so you'll know what to do. All right, let's all stand together and go to prayer. Father, we thank you for your loving mercy. We celebrate, celebrate Valentine's Day once a year. You give it to us every day. And you show us love in ways we can't even imagine. You do things to make us smile, to make us think. You do things, God, to bless us in ways that we can't imagine. You're an awesome God. So today we come together to talk about you and to be able to sing love songs to you. And for that we can just say, Happy Valentine, God. And do it by the way we act and the things we say. So you're, you're great. We love you. Your day. So be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O oh Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be your name.
it feels like I'm watching from the outside. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing. But am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers that aren't here to find. And all I know.
Let me share with you just a moment. Uh, Kenny Harris passed away. This is Jack's father and Johnny Harris's brother. Uh, he passed away and the arrangements have just been made. They're gonna be, the visitation will be Wednesday at 12 o'clock and the service will follow at one o'clock at Miles Odom Funeral Home. So Wednesday, 12 o'clock visitation, one o'clock service. Keep this in mind and pray for these families. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We thank you for being there when we need you. We thank you for being there when we don't need you. We thank you for meeting the need of this offering that's about to be collected and distributed the way you want it distributed. In your wonderful name, amen.
Thank you for the opportunity to come back to your house, Lord, and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask that you take and receive these tithes and offerings and multiply them for thy kingdom and bless the giver as they have purposed in their heart, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
as most of you know, Deborah Knight had a stroke, and she is doing physical therapy, and she has a good ways to go. And you know that Deborah, uh, the kind of work she does, if she doesn't work, she doesn't get paid. So we're going to receive a love offering for her at the end of this service. Many of you have talked to me about it, and, and we think this is the best way to go. So at the end of this service, we'll take up a love offering just for her. Give what you can, what you want to, and God will honor it. Everything that's taken up will go directly to her. All right? So keep that in mind. Open your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 24. Genesis, chapter 24. Now turn to your very last verse. And it says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Father, open the word to all of us today. Because it speaks to all of us. It's Valentine's season. A time to show special love. So we just ask you to minister to every heart and let your word become our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your book, turn to page 186. It says, to understand oneself, to understand us, is to have the wisdom from God. The lure of Satan is to deceive our minds and to tempt us to judge the actions of other people. But God's word is powerful and its message is clear. We must examine ourselves lest we fail through ignorance. Okay? Now, our prayer is this. Father, I need to understand me. You have prepared my path. You have supplied me with strength. I must be careful or else I will stumble and fall on some small obstacle. Help me to keep check on me. If I am in line with you, then everything else will fall in place. Guide me and keep me as I submit to your will, for your will will work. Lord, guide me and keep me as I submit to your will. Because your will will work. And our verse is, I will give you words of wisdom. None of your enemies will be able to stand them or to oppose them, which is God's word. Now this morning, I, I want to talk to us about Valentine's and try to help us understand a little bit more about what God expects from us and what we can do about it. It's, for those of you that were here last night, you saw the game that was played. Uh, you heard the answers that were given. And they were truly amazing. We, we had losers, <laughs> and we had losers. <laughs> That's about... That's about the best way to say it. Yeah, we had cheaters, too. I told you he cheated with his chili, and he also cheated at a game. That makes two cheaters in this church. We have one that cheats at spoons. Now, as 
your pastor, I had to step in last night and use my Christian authority on some of the questions that were asked. So we got that straight, and the uh, only problem I had was I didn't get with the contestants and get some of their answers straight. <laughs> I blew that one. But we, one of the questions was, I don't know, uh, I don't even know now, what, what is the one thing you can give your wife that makes her smile? And the number one answer was some other man. No, nobody got that one right. <laughs> but, 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 you know, here we are, uh, you guys and you gals, it's, it's going to be Valentine's Day Tuesday, and we, we hope that uh, you do something very special to honor your bride. The easiest thing in the world to do, or your groom, the easiest thing in the world to do is buy flowers. Everybody does that. Yeah. And do you know that they don't mean anything to your wife? So go spend your money on something that doesn't mean anything. Or you can do something that really will make her happy. Go buy her jewelry. And a word of wisdom is spend a lot of money on that jewelry. Just get fake jewelry. Fake looks as good as real. You cannot tell the difference. I gave Brenda a diamond necklace one time. She lost it. There on out, she got fake. <laughs> Never lost a piece of it. <laughs> Words of wisdom. I want to give you some things very quickly you guys and gals can do to make your wife and husband happy here on Valentine's Day. When you don't know what to do, you just flat out don't know what to do, I got it for you. Number one, make a homemade card with a picture of the two of you on the cover. Get ideas for a verse by spending a few minutes browsing through a card shop. Write a poem. It doesn't have to rhyme. I had one last night I made up for Tegan, and I would like to share it with you. I will later. Send a love letter. Listing the reasons why I love you so much. That'd tear her heart up. She won't believe it, but it'd tear her heart up. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Plan a surprise lunch, complete with a picnic basket, sparkling grape juice, and goblets to drink out of. That's not turkeys, goblets. Bake a giant cookie and write, I love you with a heart-shaped red hots or frosting. Don't worry about the calories. You're not going to eat it. Just look at it. Make a coupon book and include coupons for a back rub, a compromise when you're about to lose an argument. <laughs> Guys, a listening ear when needed, and doing the dishes when the other person cooks. Kidnap her car or his car and have it washed and thoroughly detailed. Compose a love song. Don't sing it. <laughs> Philip, compose a love song. Arrange for someone to sing a favorite love song to you and your loved one when you're together. We did that last night. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, make a big sign such as, I love you, Christy, or love Joe, and put it in the front yard or in front of your complex for everybody to see that goes by. But use your names. And don't use Christy and Joe. <laughs> uh, hide little love notes in a car or in a pocket or in the desk. That'd be neat. Uh, place a love message in a personal section of the classified ads in your local paper. 
That'd be a good one. Use her name. Florist flowers are not the only way to say I love you. Get a single flower out of your yard and write a message about how, be how its beauty reminds you of her love. For a greater impact, deliver it at school or work. Just your own personal thing. <laughs> Promise to change a habit that you love. Promise to change a habit that your husband or wife, your love, has been wanting you to change. Now with that one, I want to share with you. In the book of Genesis, we just read the final verse of a love story. It seems that Abraham was now very old. Sarah, his wife, had died. And he's basically on his deathbed in a, in a way. And he's raised his son Isaac, and Isaac is not married. So he wants him to have a wife. So he calls in his servant, Eleazar, and tells him, I want you to go back to my homeland, to my kin people, and find a wife for Isaac. And then I want you to bring her back here and let him marry her. So, Elazar says, well, you know, I'll do anything you want me to do. But what if I get there and she doesn't want to come back? What am I supposed to do? And Abraham basically tells her, tells him, don't worry about that. I've prayed about it. I've prayed about a wife for my son. And she will come back. So why can't she just marry someone from here? He said, because I don't want her to marry him to marry a Canaanite woman. And the reason I know that one from my home will come back is because God promised me this land in Canaan where I am and promised it to my ancestors. So I know she will. If, if, if I was preaching a sermon to the parents about raising your children, this would be a perfect place for you to realize that you have a hand in who your child marries. You don't pick them out, but you pray and you ask God for that right person in your child's life. And I sure hope parents have done that. I did it for my children. And it worked. I'll do it for my grandchildren. It'll work. Because I trust God. So pray about who your children marry. It's important. So Eleazar goes. And he gets there. It's a long journey. He gets there and he goes beside a stream. And he prays. And he says, Lord, I, I don't know which woman I'm looking for, but you let the right woman come. And so I'm going to ask her if I could have a drink of water. And if she says to me, why, certainly I'll give you a drink of water, and I'll even water your camels for you, then I'll know that's the right woman. In a little bit, here comes a woman carrying a urn with her, and she goes to the stream, and she gets the urn full of water. And she starts to leave, and he says, uh, excuse me, ma'am, total stranger. Excuse me, ma'am, uh, would you mind if I have a drink of water? She said, why, certainly not. And she walked over and gave him the jug, and he took a big swallow. She said, go ahead and have another one. While you're doing that, I'll feed your cameras for you. I'll give them plenty of water to drink. No big deal, but you ever give a camel water? He can drink enough for a week. This was no small matter. Because you see, Abraham sent 
camels, plural, as gifts, jewels and gold as gifts to this woman, whomever she was, that was to be his son's wife. And also to her parents as sort of a dowry. So there was a lot of stuff here, a lot of camels here. So she does that. And she starts to leave. He says, excuse me, ma'am. He said, do you reckon y'all have a place I could spend the night? And then I'll leave tomorrow. And she says, sure. And she leaves, leaves him standing there. She goes back to her daddy, and, which, and, and her daddy is Abraham's nephew. So it goes back to him and tells him what just happened. Well, there's a man named Laban that is her brother. He hears the story. So he runs back out to where Eleazar was and says, listen, what are you doing here? Come on, we got plenty of room. You can spend the night with us. And he does. So he says to them, listen, I want Rebecca to be my, to, I want to take her back to Abraham so that she can marry Abraham's son, Isaac. That, of course, they know Abraham. And they say, okay, you can take her. Just that easy. So they call Rebecca and ask her, said, listen, uh, what do you think about this? And she says, I want to do it. So they ask her, they ask Eleazar, said, Look, can you wait at least 10 days and let us enjoy the 10 days with our daughter? She said, nope, got to go. This is urgent. So they asked Rebecca, said, will you be willing to go right now? And she said, yes, I will. So she jumps on her camel named Clyde, and they begin to <laughs> take off through the desert. And she had a joyful spirit and a joyful song in her heart. With bells on her fingers and rings on her toes and a bone up her nose, ho, ho, she goes across the desert. They finally get back to Abraham, and Isaac is out in the field. You guys, listen. Isaac is out in the field praying, God, send me that perfect woman. And she sees a man from a distance, and she asks Eleazar, she said, listen, who, who is that guy out there? So that's Isaac, your future husband. And she jumps off the camel, and she starts running to Isaac. And she meets him there, in the place of prayer. Isn't that something? It's where he was praying. No better place to meet your future husband or wife than in church. A way to start one out. So Isaac immediately falls in love and he takes her in his mother's tent. His mother is dead. She's been dead about three years. But her tent was still there, and it was his. So he takes her in there. It says that he takes her as his wife. That means he accepts her as his wife. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. What a story. He took her into the tent, accepted her as his wife, and he loved her. So love at first sight, when it's ordained of God, true love. That's what he did for her. But look what she did for him. It says, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, his mother had already had died. That's, that's not what it's saying. It was saying that for three years, Isaac was troubled, couldn't let go of his mother's death. He mourned, he missed his mother. But when he took 
Rebecca as his wife, her love instantly took the depression and sorrow away from him that he'd had so long for his mother. It was replaced by her love. What kind of love is that? Same kind God promises to us. I will be with you always. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will help you face anything in your life if you'll trust me. And together we will walk through it. And together we will get to the other side. That's what God promises. And that's exactly what she did. So this, this is a glorious thing. It's a beautiful love story. It says, and he loved her, and she comforted him. See, we need each other. And we need each other for different reasons, not excuses. And every marriage should be based on God. Every marriage. It should be of God. And if we pray and ask God to give us the right wife and the right husband, he will. He'll send that person to our life. And I even heard Youngie Cho, who was a, a great minister, Youngie Cho said, when you pray for a spouse, pray for what you want. You girls, you pray for what you want. I want him to be six foot two. I want him to have dark hair. I want him to be kind, very considerate and loving. He said, be specific what you want. If you just say, God, send me a man, it may be an ape. <laughs> See? You, you, he said, be specific. God just sent me a woman. The devil can wear blue jeans. Pray for what you want. And then begin to thank God for it. And let your marriage begin that way. So what is real love? It says, and he loved her. What is real love? Are all the contestants here this morning from last night? No? Tish and Jack, yeah, they're in divorce court this morning. That's right. I remember. Uh, <laughs> other than that, no, nah, they're at the funeral home making all the arrangements. But other than that, all the contestants are here. What that means is they went through that trial of darkness last night. And they're still together. And you can call that a type of real love. A type of it. So let's define what real love is. Real love to begin with always does the right thing for the right reason. Okay? You do the right thing for the right reason. Because there's a reason behind everything that you do, <clears throat> and you got to make sure it's the right thing. So that's the first thing that we talk about real love. There's a little boy. Oh, you get a little boy. There was a teenager that came home one night, told his daddy, said, Daddy, I'm fixing to get married. And dad said, you fixing to get married? He said, yes, sir. And dad says, well, do you know what marriage is? Do you have the right girl? He says, yes, sir, I got the right one. He said, well, son, how do you know you got the right one? He said, daddy, tonight I held her in my arms, and I kissed her. And while I was kissing her, her dog bit me. <laughs> and said, you know what, daddy? I didn't even feel it until I got home. <laughs> Powerful kiss. Great love. I think that's the way a lot of marriages are entered into for the wrong reason. We don't know what love is. We know what infatuation is. 
because that's what we get with motor motorcycles, run up and down here and run up and down here. You know, that's infatuation. That's where you say you love somebody one minute, the next minute you ain't speaking to them because they looked at another guy. Yeah, that, that's infatuation. We don't know what love is. But love is doing the right thing for the right reason. And you have to figure out what is the right thing. Jesus said, no greater love hath anyone than to be willing to lay down his life for someone else. And I've told you all before, that doesn't necessarily mean dying for them. It could. Jesus made that statement. He died on the cross for me and you because of his love for us. And no greater love, he said, is there for anyone than you be willing to do that, that you do that. But that isn't the whole thing. Being willing to lay down your life means that while you're living, you'll lay down your life. Laying down your life is giving up. You think about it. Those of you that's married, you need to re-examine yourself. Listen to this. Those of you that's not married, think twice and see if you're willing to do this. See if you're willing to experience real love. It gives up something. That's laying down. Your hopes. What you want to be. Would you be willing to give that up for her? Your dreams. The dreams you've always had about the perfect life. Would you be willing to lay that down and do something different? Your desires. What is your desire? Are you willing to change that desire? Your plans. Your goals that you want to achieve in life. The ambition that you have. You're willing to lay it down. Because he or she means more to you than what your personal, egotistical things mean to yourself. The idea of being all you can be. Would you lay that down? What things would you change? The things that you are right now. The things that you will become. Are you willing to lay it down and change it? And change it for things that she might want or that he might want. Are you willing to put good, which represents a good marriage, above your own wants? Are you willing to have patience and endurance? Patience to wait, endurance to last. Are you willing to have that in a relationship that you want to be complete in your life? It's called being unselfish. And we, by nature, are selfish individuals. But would you be willing to become unselfish? Give up yourself. Lay down your life, your plans, your hopes, your dreams. Lay them down for your mate. Would you be willing to? And see, we, we say... Yes, you better believe it. That's what we say before we get married because we don't know what happens after you get married. How quickly that mascara that she wears, that when she takes them off, that's real scare them. <laughs> yeah. Mascara hides the real scare them. You see, you got, you got to learn that. But those of us who are married, well, this becomes a greater thing for us because we've already gotten settled in. We've already gotten that one. You see, you girls fix that hair so pretty. Put on that mascara so thick. Wear the right stuff the right way to tease us and to entice us and to put us in la-la land so that we'll do anything for you. You guys, you agree as your hair back? Wear them V-neck things, pop them muscles, <laughs> open the door for her. You do all those things. Then you get married. And now she can open the door herself. There's nothing wrong with her arms. 
She can go to the store by herself. I'm watching gun smoke. <laughs> she can sit home alone and take care of the kids while I'm hunting or fishing. And she, on the other hand, she doesn't wear mascara anymore. This is what you paid for. <laughs> this is the real me. I done got you. I don't have to do nothing special. I wear my house coat around the house 24-7, and you can fix your own meals. You see? And the guy said, or she says, you never tell me you love me. He says, I told you when we got married, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> so we see that we've got to do the right thing. And laying down your life, laying down your life, are you willing to give things up? Yeah, we say yes, but I'm telling you, it's, it's not true. It's just not true because we think more of ourselves than we do our mates. Oh, me. So many times. And all you want to do is pray that you die first. Because if your partner dies first, you will live a life of regret. And I don't care how good you are. You live a life of regret. Of things you wish you had done. Of things where you wish you'd have given up yourself for your mate. A gift from God that you didn't honor in ways that you should have. Therefore, your marriage never became what God created it to be. The second thing is, to have real love, you've got to have a certain amount of caring attributes. Caring for one another. That's not what we do, just to flip it. I love you. Yeah, you, back at you. It's not running to town at the last minute, buying flowers, just grabbing a card, sign a love and give it to her. It's not that. There's no love in that. It's just simply an act. That's all it is. It's that I don't know how you have to do it. You see? No, we're trying to figure out what you can do to show your love. It doesn't have to be flowers. It doesn't have to be candy. It doesn't have to be jewelry. I gave you a list a while ago. I can make the list, and then you guys want to take one home with you. You've got two days. But it's doing something to show your care and your love. Remember back in the day, those of you that are old enough to remember it, when we had soft drinks, and the thing was, let's go get a Coke. And you go to the store and you get a Coke. But what that meant was you may get a Pepsi, you may get a 7-Up. Everything was referred to as a Coke. Every drink, it's a Coke. Let's go get a Coke. And then one day, Coke got a hold of that, and they said, this ain't right. And they came out with the, logo, slogan, the, the uh, slogan, Coke, the real thing. Now, that changed it. So now we got to get a Pepsi. Diet Pepsi. Dr. Pepper. Diet. Cherry. I love them. <laughs> Sprite. Right around. We, we're very specific now. And a lot of our marriages are that way. Love you. And that's it. It's like Coke. Whatever it means. But our mates want us to be specific. And do something and share something and show something that means something to them. Just from you. So many people today will tell your wife or your husband they love them. We do that here. I love you, Mary. See? She told me she loved me back. 
So it, it can't be, I love you, Mary, and then me turn to my wife and say, I love you. And it's the same thing because your wife's special. So you got to be caring. you got to be somehow, some way you can do it. How do you do that? After, after, after a time of marriage, how do you do that? How do you muster up that caring attitude that over the amount of time has been caked over with your selfishness? You care more about yourself than you do your mate. And I'm talking about men and women now. We're not talking about, we're not talking about just women. How do you do that? I'll read you something. A woman goes to her psychiatrist. And she says, I got problems. I am fed up with my husband. And I want a divorce. But I don't want one of your routine divorces. I want to hurt him so bad. I want to destroy him. I want to do evil to him in this divorce proceedings for all the things he's done to me. The lawyer thought for a minute. He said, okay. He said, do you really want to get him? She says, I really want to get him. He said, okay, here's what you do. I want you to go home. And for two weeks, I want you to love him. I want you to make him think that he's God's gift to the world. I want you to tell him every day how much you love him. Tell him how much he means to you. Tell him that you just can't live without him. You, you've got to have him. In, oh, what a joy he is in your life. Cook him some wonderful meals and serve him. Put candles out there. Make it really neat. Wear some sexy things. Do some things that makes him think. Go with him on the things he does. Just build his ego up. Make that man believe that he is the greatest thing that ever happened. Make him love you. Tell him you have an undying love for him. That's eternal. She says, I'll do it. He said, now when you do, in two weeks, then we're going to drop the bomb on him. After you got him set up, boy, we're going to nail him. So she says, yeah, I like it. And she's foaming at the mouth. And, you know, just, so she leaves. Well, two months pass by. I mean, two weeks pass by. He didn't hear a thing. Then a month goes by. He doesn't hear a thing. The, doc, the doctor. So he calls her. He says, Miss So-and-so says, listen, I haven't heard from you. How'd things go with your husband? You ready to drop the bomb? She says, oh, no, sir. She said, I did all the things that you told me to do. But I don't want a divorce now. Because I found out I really do love him. I really do love him. So what made the difference? The same thing that you can do in your life. Her actions changed her feelings. See, that's what's wrong with most of us. We want to blame our mate for all the problems. And we refuse to look at ourselves. So we cast it there. But her, her changes changed her, made her different. Her emotion, the things she did, changed her emotions. Emotions can change emotions. You got to do something. Well, just think about it. It could be you that where the problem is. Most of the time, it's both of you. It's not one of you. But somebody has to start it. See, love is not built on promises. It's built on repeated actions. Over and over and over and over. And if it gets to be repetition, it's okay as long as it's coming from the heart. All I do is draw you closer together. So you got to make sure that somewhere in there, there's caring attributes. And the last one is, real love will stand the test of time. It'll stand it. I 
told you before, as soon as Brenda and I got married, we were together and we talked and we said one thing that won't happen is divorce. That word is not in our vocabulary. If it's not in your vocabulary, you can't use it. See? We were in it for the long run. And that brought us through many trials and tribulations because we knew there was no way out except to work it out. And that's what you got to do. It's for the long run. We're not going to be torn apart by each other. See, suppose you had a, a car and you love that car and somebody came along and they took your windshield wipers off, took the rubber off of them. And all you had left was that piece of metal. Well, it would still work, but every time it worked, it wouldn't let you see. And it scratched your glass, messed your glass up. Then the next thing they did was tear your door off. Now you got a problem because you can't keep the weather out. It rains inside it, mold and mildew. Pests get in there. Then one day, you decide you knock the black back glass out. You knock it out. Now you're really in trouble because every element and everything that you've ever tried to do gets in there. And you look at that car, what used to be a nice car, and it's ruined. And do you know that that car at one time was the pride of Detroit City? Whoever made that car, whatever company, that was their pride and joy when the thing rolled off of the assembly line. But through time, it got messed up and it's no good. It's ugly. A good marriage is the pride of God. Amen. See, God says, seek the mate I have for you and treat him and her like a king or queen. Give of yourself to them. Become unselfish. And deny yourself and build up that marriage. And that will be the pride of God. But so many of our marriages, we've had the windshield wipers taken off, the doors dropped off, the windows busted, and our marriage looks like shambles. Or we think it's okay and we'll keep driving it because I don't want to buy a new one. But it hurts God to see that. You that aren't married, Make sure you're willing to do that before you get married. It will last through time, and it will be everything that God wants it to be. So as you look at that today, ask yourself, you know, what is your marriage? What, what does it look like today? How much do you love your wife, your husband? Does badness exceed goodness in your marriage? Is there more bad than there is good? Do you just show your kind of love on special days when you have to, not because you want to? You got to figure all that out. A great marriage is a testimony to God. But great marriages aren't born. They're created through love. And when you have the love of God like you should, you have the love towards your mate. They're not a piece of flesh. They're not a toy. And they're not an occasional joy. They're God's gift. They're queens and they're kings. Treat them like it. Whatever you want your marriage to be, whatever you want your husband or wife to be, you be that to them. And you watch what happens. Father, I pray today for every person in this building that we will be everything you want us to be. 
that we will give you everything you want and then I give our mates everything they want and desire from us as Christians. Let love not be something we say, but something we do. And God, let us learn to get rid of the selfish attitudes we have. And become the men and women that you created us to be. True happiness is a great marriage. True happiness is yielding to someone else. True happiness is being willing to give our life for our mates. Help us to learn how to do it and then do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And before you go, we're going to receive an offering, and I would ask.